This represents a population, everybody in a population. I'm indicating the population mean is mu, uh, 100. Okay, I'm not showing it as X bar, I'm showing it as a Greek letter. I didn't, I didn't have the Greek letter handy, so I just put mu, the, name, the Greek letter. Uh, the standard deviation for the population is 20. And this represents the distribution of the entire population. Half the population has a value above 100, half the population below 100. We know that 95% of the population has a value between 60, standard deviation is 20, so two standard deviations above, below to two standard deviations above roughly. We know now it's really 1.96 standard deviations. And if I were to ask you what percentage of the population, let's say this is IQ, what percentage of the population has an IQ above 140, you will know, hey, that looks like it's roughly two standard deviations above. In fact, it's exactly two standard deviations above. Uh, so that would leave between negative two and positive two standard deviations is 95%. So since this is symmetrical, we would have half of the 5% that's left above two and below negative two. So that would be about two and a half percent of that population. So we have a good idea of what, how this population is distributed. We never really get to work with this population. Where, with this population is an exercise for us because we're making believe that we really know the values for the entire population. So now let's take a look at what happens if instead I take samples from that population. I repeatedly take samples of size 16 from that population. Well, when I, when I uh, uh, display a distribution, a, a histogram, or if I take enough samples, an actual curve that represents how all those sample means are distributed, I get, it's, I get a narrower distribution. Instead of being uh, three, uh, three standard deviations being like 40 to 160, now it's 85 to 115. You see how I got that, right? The uh, standard deviation before was 20. The sample size is 16. So 20 divided by the square root of the sample size, which comes out to be four, is five. So two standard deviations above is gonna be 110, and two standard deviations below is gonna be 90. Now when I look at 110, what I'm, de what I'm describing is I'm describing the percentage of samples of size 16 from that first population that I would expect to be above um, uh, 110, okay? Uh, but I, you, you would get 2.5% of the time, you'd get a sample average of size 16 randomly selected from that population above 110. Let's see if I can't get this to do it in a friendly manner. Okay, I could do it that way. Okay, so now 110, we decided that 2.5% of the time, if we took a sample of 16 people, that the average of that sample would be 110 or higher. Okay, well how about, how often would it be higher than 115 if I took a sample of size 16 from that population? Well, let's see. That we know, three standard deviations, three standard, that's 99.7% of the distribution. That only leaves like 0.1% at this end and 0.15% at this end, 0.15% at this end. So. A tenth of one percent, roughly, of the time, if I took a sample uh, from that population, I'd get a mean for those 16 people above 115. Yes? So that's quite different than in the population. You were talking about people above a certain IQ, but here, they don't have to be in that place above a certain IQ. They can be anywhere above. Well, the people, the people themselves, they might have values 110, 120, right. 100, and so it's just the average that I would get. We're just looking at how, how uh, samples behave. Okay, so now, at what point would you say that it's impossible, you can't get from this sample a, a, a sample of 16 people that's gonna be that high? How about if I asked you about 120? Is that possible? Yes? I didn't know that you could ever say it's impossible, but you can exactly, unlikely. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. This is asymptotic. It's never going to reach that, that, that line at the bottom. It's never going to be zero. There's some finite chance that it could be 120. And, uh, or it could be 155 even. Very, extremely, extremely unlikely. This past week, 
how many standard deviations above 100 is this, as a matter of fact? Five, let's see, 55 above 100, that's 11 standard deviations above. The odds of that occurring are probably one in a bazillion, bazillion, or something like that, anything right? Anything above six is like Yeah, anything above six is, a, is enormously unlikely. You might have read this past week that the physicists have decided that they have discovered, indeed, the Higgs boson. boson. And the reason why they've all agreed that now they think they really have discovered this particle is because the probability that any other particle would, be, would behave this way that they're observing this particle that they know about, the, any other particle they know about behaving exactly that way, is six standard deviations from what they would expect. In other words, that's how unlikely. Is it five or six? Is it five? I think they shoot. They're usually six for six. They had to get to five. Yeah, yeah, I guess, I guess they could have waited until six, but they couldn't wait. They, get, they were too anxious. But usually astronomical stuff or, or uh, subatomic physics and stuff like that, they usually look for six standard deviations. But I guess five is pretty good too, right? I mean, that's like, you know, uh, 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 five or six orders of magnitude at least. So it's very unlikely. But it could occur. So it's not, there's not a point at which you say it can't happen. So as public health people, we do studies. And in these studies, we have to say to ourselves, well, I'm going to do a study. And I want to know, at what point can I say that if I took a sample of 16 people from some other population, that the value for that population, the mean for that population, is really different than this one is? Do I need to be three standard deviations away, four standard deviations away, one standard deviation? What point do I cut that off? At what point do I say it's different enough than what I would expect from this population uh, that I would say that, you know, that there is a difference between the two population means? Okay? And usually we say that that's 95% confidence or 5% chance of being wrong. 5% chance of being wrong is our two standard deviations on either side. Instead of six standard deviations like physicists, we're perfectly happy with two standard deviations. Okay, so now what does that really mean? That means that if I go back here, right, go back to here, if I take 16 people from another population and they get a, and I get a mean of 110 or better for those 16 people, I feel justified in saying that there's a difference between those two, those two population means because it's less than 5% chance above 110 that it came from this population. We'd only get that extreme a number, well, 2.5% here. But we also tend to do two-tail tests a lot of the times, which means I'm looking really, when I get a test 110 or higher, I'm also testing two standard deviations below as well in order to say that it's different. Okay, you could do a one-tail test, but then you don't have to be two standard deviations difference. You could be a little less, right? Because we could then we use that whole 5% here. That's called a one-tail test. So in general, most of the time, we're willing to say there's a difference between two populations. It, when we sample a population, and when we sample one population and we compare it to the mean of another, and we have less than 5% chance of getting that result from the other population. Okay, that's what we'd be happy with. That is called our alpha error. That's the, per, the probability we're willing to, the, the chances we're willing to take that, to make an error. Well, what does that, what does that mean, you know, in terms of like, you know, uh, 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 our, uh, uh, in terms of like what we can do with this data? Well, it means that we're pretty sure we're right, but there is a finite possibility, and not, not a small finite possibility, a decent one, 5% chance that we could say two results are statistically different, and indeed they don't wind up being different. So what, what happens in most studies if you get something interesting that occurs, and you get like say 5% chance of it being wrong, 95% chance of you being right, right? What most, most of the time what happens after something like that, a new study with new, some new finding? What's the first thing somebody else does? They repeat the study, right? To see if they get the same result, right? See if they can confirm that, perhaps with a larger sample size, perhaps, you know, like changing the conditions a little bit or something like that, or even just perhaps doing exactly the same study again and see if they get the same result. 
And this happens all the time. When I was in college 100,000 years ago, there was a study done with planaria. Anybody know what planaria are? There, you know, no, and, Right, flatworms. If you have fish, you know those little red worms that uh, the little red flatworms that you feed fish. Those are planaria. Uh, planaria. Uh, some group did a study of planaria, in which they they react to light. In other words, they react to light and they react to. They have a sense of smell, I guess, so that they can detect food and stuff. And they would uh, reinforce the planaria in a little tiny maze. They would reinforce them for turning in the direction of a light. And then, and then, you know, put some food in there or something like that. So they literally trained some planaria to respond to light in a certain way in a maze, right? And learn to learn like a few turns in a maze or something like that. Or to turn right all the time or to turn left all the time. They trained them somehow or other. They, how can I put this gently? They put, the, they ground up the planaria to put them in a blender basically. And they fed them to other planaria, right? And they fed trained planaria to one group, untrained planaria to the other group, right? And they found that the, the, in their study, in their particular study, they found the planaria that ate the trained planaria learned faster in that environment, in that same test, as the ones that didn't, uh, uh, that ate naive, what, I guess what you would call naive planaria, right? So, you guys think this sounds like reasonable? Right? No, it's not, yeah, it's a little nuts, right? As it, well, they found a statistically significant difference. They did a, literally a double-blind study and found a statistically significant uh, difference. They uh, published this information. Everybody went wild. I don't know where, who they got to publish. It was somebody got published before them. Oh, in fact, I know who published it. They couldn't get it published, so they published it in their own publication, which they called the Worm Runner's Digest. And in fact, a lot of questionable papers wound up getting published in that, in that uh, journal which lasted a few years. I don't know whatever happened to it. But what do you think happened the first time somebody tried to replicate that? They didn't get the same result. They just got, I guess you could make your own choice, they either got lucky or unlucky when they did the first study, and that happens. One, time, once, one out of 20 times, you're going to get a study that's going to give you the wrong result, right? Or allow you to uh, say that there's a difference when there really isn't a difference. That's a problem for public health people because we may decide that a certain intervention, which may cost a lot of money, be very invasive, uh, so on and so forth, uh, we find that we think that's effective at, at solving some sort of problem. And then if we're wrong, a lot of money gets invested, there's a lot of disturbance, there's a lot of issues that go along with that. So that kind of error, when you say there's a difference and there really isn't a difference called an alpha error, that's a bad error. We don't want alpha errors. We have to tolerate them because otherwise we'd have to have studies with like 100,000 you know, people or test entire populations to be absolutely sure. So, but we like to minimize alpha errors. Now, if you try and minimize alpha errors, what happens? What happens is, is that sometimes 5% of the time we could take these two populations that are, uh, 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 we could take uh, a sample from another population and, and it turns out to be 109 is the mean of that population, right? And it is indeed different than 100, which is this population, but not different enough for our sample size to be able to say that they're different with 5% chance of being wrong, right? They're on this side over here, it says more than 5% chance of being wrong. In that case, we miss the difference. We fail to say there's a difference in those two populations. We fail to say that the drug is proven to work better than the control group works. Okay, that's called a beta error. They're not considered as bad an error. However, you know, there is a certain loss in that because you have to repeat the study. If you think you found something significant, now you have to repeat the study with typically what would you do if you have a situation like that where you got pretty close to proving something, but not quite. What might you do in order to make this narrower so you could be further out in standard deviations. Samples, a bigger sample size, right? Might be one thing. Or restructuring the study in some way. Okay, so that's really what we're after here. Okay, so now, how do we, how do we uh, evaluate all this stuff? The first thing is because this is all based on the dy dynamics of how samples behave, how we can take a sample from a population, 
and based on that sample, based on the size of that sample, derive a whole new distribution for samples of that size and know that they're normally distributed themselves and know various things about the properties, how likely they are to get, sample, get samples of certain sizes based on what we know about the population. Uh, well, we're gonna ch uh, there are certain assumptions that we make. Number one, that the original population is roughly uh, 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 normally distributed. That's particularly important if you're taking small samples. We'll get to that. Uh, number two, that we're, taking, we're doing a random sample. Okay, so I'm gonna, we're going to worry about those two things mostly for now. Uh, you guys remember what that's called? That, that understanding of the, uh, the, the fact that if we take repeated samples, they're normally distributed and have their own standard deviation or standard error. What was that called again? Central limit, Central limit theorem. Perfect. Great. Okay, so we've got to check our assumptions. Number two, we construct the hypothesis, right? So now, what are we usually trying to say? We're trying to say that the mean of this group is different than the mean of this group, right? So we're going to start out by being devil's advocate and saying that there's no difference between the two of that, th the two of them. We're going to say the mean of group A is equal to the mean of group B. Okay. Well, that's called the null hypothesis. Okay. Then we're going to propose an alternative hypothesis, which says that well, that's wrong. That's not true. The mean of group one is not equal to the mean of group two. Okay, most of the time, that's where you're working. You're working right at that point. You don't really care whether the second group is bigger or smaller. You want to prove that they're different, and you let the chips fall where they may. Sometimes you're going to make a determination ahead of time that I think the only way that this can happen is for group two to be bigger than group, group one. For instance, let's say you're, you know, you're testing a, um, uh, a blood pressure medication and you know that this medication is a vasodilator, and you know that there's no way in the world that a vasodilator is going to increase blood pressure, you might say, physically, there's no way for me to get, to demonstrate that it's, le it's going to increase blood pressure, so I'm going to do a single-sided test and say that they're either the same, our null hypothesis, or group two is low, the, 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 the drug group is lower than the control group. The mean of the drug group is lower than the mean of the control group. Right, you can do a single-sided hypothesis. The more conservative approach is to do a two-sided test, right? Because when you do a two-sided test, you take your 5% chance of error and you put 2.5% on each side. So you have to be further out in terms of number of standard deviations different in order to prove it, in order to reject your null hypothesis. Everybody, everybody kind of get that? So we'll get, we'll get to a demonstration of that. Okay, so now, how do we test it? We're testing the number, difference in the number of standard deviations. Just as I did there, how do I get that? The mean for group one minus the mean for group two. In this case, in this theoretical case, I'm comparing the mean of my sample to the mean of the population. And I'm dividing that by the standard error. Standard error is based on the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of the sample size, right? This is your standard error. This is the difference between the two means. And that gives you the number of standard deviations apart that they are. If this comes out to be two, right, then we say, oh, they're far enough apart that there's less than 5% chance of that occurring. So we reject our null hypothesis and we say the two groups are different. Now, if it's a big sample size, what do we, what do we use here instead of T? Z. We use Z, right? We don't bother going to the T table and stuff like that. If it's a sample size that's small, Typically, on a practical basis, 30 or less, we would use the t-table. T-table is a little bit different. We'll, we'll see how that works out. Okay, we don't just do this with uh, 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 scalar values like IQ, weight, BMI, and stuff like that. We also do it with proportions. We have a lot of, a lot of information that's uh, based on proportions. For instance, uh, the probability that something that some uh, that someone might have a certain condition, say diabetes, might be 10%. So we might have a population that we know that has uh, diabetes at the rate of 10%, and we're comparing it to another population that we took a sample of 100 people, and we have 11 people out of that 100 that got that have diabetes, and we have 11% 
and that's 10% from the population we're comparing it to. So now we have a difference between these. We treat them just like we would the mean. We have the difference in the proportions. P cap represents a sample proportion. P0 represents the population proportion that we're comparing it to, divided by the standard error for that distribution of proportions. You guys remember how we calculate the standard error for proportions? It's P0 times 1 minus P0 over n, we take the square root of that. In this case, the, what I des just described, it would be 0.1 times 0.9 over uh, 100, and we take the square root of it. Okay, we took the population proportion here, right? Assuming that we know it. A lot of cases, we're not gonna know it, but at this stage, we're gonna go with, uh, we're go gonna go with the assumption that we know the population proportion. If we don't know the population proportion, sometimes we just stick 0.5 in there. Because the highest possible, if I say 0.1 times 0.9, I get 0.09. If I say 0.4 times 0.6, I get 0.24. If I say 0.5 times 0.5, I get 0.25. The biggest number I can get is if P is equal to 5, 0.5, right? So sometimes we just stick 0.5 in there because it's a conservative guess at the population proportion, even if we know it's different than 0.5. But if we have any kind of hint about it, we might, we might use that instead. But pretty simple calculation so far, right? We're looking for basically the same thing, the z-score or the t-score. This one is always going to say z because one of the assumptions that you make when you do this kind of analysis is that how many people do you have in the group from the, from, that represents PCAP? 15. 15, right? How many uh, in this group? 15, you need at least 15 in each group, right? So 15 in each group, you got 30, right? So 30 is analogous to having 30 in your other test, so we don't bother with T when we do this work with proportions, because part of our assumption requires a certain sample size that would allow us to use Z anyway. Okay, good. Then we calculate the p-value. Now, a moment ago I said to you that all we care about is it's less than 5% that we're at least 1.96 or two standard deviations apart when we look at the two means or the two proportions. In reality, not, we want to know more about it though. Uh, when you read a study and they tell you that they had a statistically significant result, you're interested in, you already know based on all the, what we've done so far, that well, what they're trying to say is, is that we're 95% certain, or we think there's less than 5% chance that we're wrong when we say that there's a difference between the two means, okay? Well, it's also of interest to you, well, less than 5%, but do you mean 4% chance of being wrong? Do you mean 1% chance of being wrong? Do you mean 0.001% chance of being wrong? That's called the p-value. Not to be confused with the proportion that we were working with before. That's the probability the true probability that you would be uh, wrong if you, uh, uh, it, it, when, if you rejected the null hypothesis. And what that's based on is what the real z-score is. You look at the z-score and you see what the actual error is, area there that's at the tail, your chance of being wrong, and you, and you use that number for your p-value, okay? Um, uh, uh, rather than just saying that there's less than 5% chance of being wrong. Okay, then you make a conclusion. What's your conclusion? In, uh, in, uh, uh, hopefully your conclusion is, is that we reject the null hypothesis, the mean for uh, uh, group one is different from the mean to for group two, the, the uh, uh, or excuse me, the, the, for the population groups, uh, the, uh, uh, or the proportion of people in this population that have this disease is different than the proportion in this population that have the, this, this disease. The reduction in blood pressure from, this, from the uh, drug is different than the, redu uh, the, the uh, reduction in blood pressure for the control group. Okay? So you know you can reject that null hypothesis that they're equal and you accept your alternative hypothesis, whatever my, that might be. Okay, whatever way you wrote it out, that there is a difference between the two of them, that one is greater than the other if we're talking about a one-sided test. But again, most of the time, talking two-sided tests. Okay, fail to reject. Okay, and just if you look at these, if this is two groups and you look at it graphically, the mean of this group is here, the mean of this group is here, right? So if I look for two standard deviations across, right, I'm looking over here, my alpha error is gonna be this area from, if this is the value, 
My alpha error is the area of distribution from here to here. My beta error now is 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 uh, the probability that I would get that higher level that that I would get a sample from this group that I wouldn't identify and reject, and that's going to be my beta error that's in there. Okay, so there's something called power, and it represents one minus the beta uh, uh, percentage. Um, when we're not going to worry about that right now, we'll get to that later on when we get to feel a little bit more comfortable with this stuff. Is the beta and uh, alpha just different terminology for type one and type two? Yes, exactly. Okay. Okay. Good. Let's get. Let's pull up homework number six, and we'll we'll do a quick example of confidence interval just to get warmed up, and then we'll go to homework number seven, and we'll start looking at some of the uh, hypothesis testing problems. What's that? I was just asking what slide number that was. Oh, that, I, I don't That's know. It was the last one. It, yeah. uh, da, 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 okay. Okay. Proportion. Uh, a Time magazine coded a poll performed in 2002 of 1,000 Americans in which only 4% said that they were vegetarians. I'll bet you it's more now, right? Okay, using Excel, construct a, first of all, number one, you, it, nowadays you'd have to, you know, like uh, define vegetarian because there's 97,000 kinds of vegetarians. Okay, <laughs> using Excel, construct a 95% confidence interval for the true population proportion of vegetarians in 2002. Okay, so now 1,000, 4%. So I'm going to uh, pull, bring up Excel. And in fact, even before I work on Excel, maybe I can write right on this. Okay, so the proportion, pay, oops, that won't let me do that. Maybe I can, maybe I can make it let me do that. Nope, I'll bring up a window here. Okay, so P is equal to 0.04. Right, and our sample size equals 1,000. Right, so what's my standard deviation or my standard error for this sample of a, sa a sample size of 1,000? It's going to be equal to the square root of p times 1 minus p over n, okay, which is going to be equal to the square root of 0 0.04 times 0 0.96 over. 1,000, okay, and that's going to be equal to, let's, let's work it out. Okay. Okay, I get 0.0384 for the top part. And I get four zeros, 384 for the, uh, 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 for the entire um, uh, number inside the uh, square root. And I'm gonna find, square, I gotta do it this way. Square root of that is 0.006. Okay, so now my confidence interval. My confidence interval is equal to P for my sample, plus or minus, what's that called again? That's my point estimate, right? Okay, plus or minus some number, it's gonna be T or Z, in this case it's gonna be Z, times our standard error. Okay, which is gonna be equal to 0.04, plus or minus, uh, standard error is going to be point, oops, excuse me, z times 0.006. Okay, so now, what am I going to use for z here? Yes? 
Okay, 95, for a 95% confidence interval, we would use 1.96. Okay, for a 99% confidence interval, what would I use? A mm, little higher, 2.58, right? Okay, if we look it up on the Z table. Okay, so it's going to be equal to 0.04 plus or minus uh, uh, 1.96. I'm going to make it 2 times 0.006 which is going to be 0 .04 plus or minus 0 0.012. Okay, so my confidence interval is going to be, well, let's see, 0 0.12 less than that is going to be 0 0.28, 0 0.028 to 0 .5, uh, 0 0.52, 0 0.052. Right? In other words, 2.8% to 5.2%. If we did a study, if we did this study, and indeed the population uh, 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 proportion was 4%, this would tell us that, uh, and, and we found that our sample indicated it was 0.4%, was 4%. We found that our 95% confidence interval for the two true population proportion is 2.8% to 5.2%. Two percent. Okay. If we wanted ninety-nine percent confidence at the row, we just would have substituted one point uh, two point five eight for the one point nine six. Everybody okay with that? Yeah. Except right? I think your very first thing wasn't right. Uh, <laughs> 0.04 which, times point nine six. I get point nine two one six. Point nine. It's going to be well. First of all, number. Uh, it's going to be point oh something, right? Right. It's going to be less than point oh four. Right, so it's going to be 0 0.039 something, 0 0.03 something. Oh, I see what I mean. Okay, okay. divided by 1,000. It's a little tricky, right? It's easier to use a calculator or Excel. Yes? Can you just say it again, like, in terms of like how you would say you're finding it? Yeah. Like, because I think it's important. Uh, I would say that uh, we are 95% confident that the true population proportion of vegetarians in the United States in 2010 is between... 2.8% and 5.2%. Okay. In other words, we took a sample of 1,000 people. We found that 4% of those 1,000 people were vegetarians. But we don't think that, you know, uh, that the odds of us getting the exact right percentage of, of uh, 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 vegetarians in the population in our sample of 1,000 is, is almost infinitesimally small that we'd get exactly the right percentage. Right. So based on that percentage, we can determine how this information would be distributed uh, if we use that 0.4 as the standard deviation for the population. Okay, so so we use that uh, 0.4, point, that 4% or that 0.04 to be our standard for to be our standard deviation. We uh, we then come in here, uh, uh, we calculate our standard error based on that 0.04. I'm, I'm starting to confuse using scalar numbers with pro proportions, but you get the idea. We're, we're using that point, that 4%, to determine what the standard deviation, how spread out that these possibilities would be. Right, because if there's a 50% chance of being a vegetarian, well then you're going to get some samples out of 1,000 where you're going to get 400 and you're going to get uh, 700 and so on and so forth people in that particular sample. When it's only 4% chance of being a vegetarian, it's going to be a narrower group most likely. Okay, so, so we're going to use that as our standard error, and we're going to use our standard error to determine how far apart from that, from that point estimate that we got, that 4%, how far apart we have to be in standard deviations to get two standard deviations apart, so we know we're 95% certain that the real population uh, proportion is, is within those two numbers. Okay, so same way we're about to do it with, let me go here, and let's give this a try with some real numbers, with some scalar numbers. Okay, let's see, that's another proportion. Okay, some of these are, are uh, uh, things that you're going to use Excel for, or if you want, you can use SPSS for. For instance, this one, 
I give you not, uh, a sample of nine people, number of hours of TV that they're watching. I don't tell you what the standard deviation is, right? You actually have to go into Excel, calculate the point estimate, your mean, calculate the standard deviation of this sample, okay? And we're going to be using Z or T for this particular calculation. T, we're going to be using T because small sample size, right? Okay, and we don't know the population standard deviation. We're going to assume it's the same standard deviation as the sample has. Okay, so we're going to, let me see if I got one that's uh, not going to require that. Oh, those are big numbers. Oh, those are big numbers too. Okay, let's take a look at this one. Okay, somebody, if you got it on your computer, I'm going to ask you to help me with this in terms of the math. Okay, if you can do it in Excel, 43,500 and 16,870. Okay, take a sample of all the uh, uh, salaries for the psychologists that, that got their MSs in a particular year. And I think the mean, X bar, oops. X bar is equal to 43,500. And the standard deviation of the sample was, how much was it? 18,000? Somebody reading it? I'm sorry, say again? 16,870. 870. Okay, and what's the sample size? It was 81, right? 81 psychologists was the sample size? Am I right about that? Yeah, 81. 81. Okay, okay, good. So now, we, we don't know the population standard deviation. So we have to use the standard deviation for our sample in this case. So immediately I say to myself, I don't know the population standard deviation, so I'm a little uncertain about what that standard deviation is. I have to consider using the t-test instead of the z-test. However, I have a pretty big sample size here. So now I'll say to myself, well, I can tolerate using the z-test instead. So I'm not going to look up what the t-value is. I'm going to, we might actually give it a try anyway, just for the hell of it. Okay, so now I know my point estimate, my mean is 43,500. Now let me see what I'm going to, what my standard error for the samples is going to be. My standard error is going to be equal to my standard deviation over the square root of the sample size. Well, very conveniently, Square root of uh, 81 is 9, right, is equal to, somebody divide that for me, or I'll do it for myself. Clear. 1,874. 1,874. So what's our confidence interval going to be? Our confidence interval is going to be just like it was with proportion, x bar plus or minus, instead of p cap, x bar, plus or minus the z-score or t-score we're going to use, which is going to be 1.96 times my standard error, based on the standard deviation of the sample size, times uh, $1,874. Okay, and I'm going to calculate what my confidence interval is. I'm going to round this off. You're going to be doing it in real life for homework. This is about 3,700, say roughly. So it's 4,300, uh, I'm going to call it 3,500. It's going to be easier for me to do. What's that? 3,600. I'm going I'm to round it off just, so, just, just for our purposes. So it's going to be, the higher number is going to be, let's see, it's going to be 43,500 minus 3,500. It's going to be 40,000 to 43,000 plus that is going to be 47,000. I'm 95% confidence that the real average um, uh, um, uh, uh, salary for a newly graduated psychologist with a master's degree is between these two numbers. Okay, my sample point estimate was 43,500, but I don't know how, whether I'm lower than the real population, higher than the real population, but at least with this I can have a range where I can tell you how certain I am. I'm 95% certain that the real population mean is between these two numbers. Okay, now if I went to France and I did the same study and I, and I found out in France that the average salary is 49,000, 
gee, I'm pretty sure that's higher than the one I got here, right? It's different. But if it's 46,000, you know, I could have got the, you know, it could be the one in America is the same as the one in France, right? That's, what the conf that's why the confidence interval gives us some extra value, because now we can compare it to another group somewhere else and see if there's really a difference. Because anytime you take a sample, you don't know if the difference, whether this group is higher than the other group because of just pure chance when you, you know, the people you happen to take uh, that you randomly sampled in that situation, or if the two means for the whole populations are really different. We're going to take exactly this same thing, and we're going to rework it now into hypothesis testing. Really, hypothesis testing is the same as doing this, right? Except that you structure it a little bit more. So let's go back, and let's go here. And now I'm going to open up homework number seven. And check how much time I have. Okay, we're getting pretty close. Okay, now, in this case, the first one's a proportion. Let me see if I can find something a little simpler. Okay, H how many of you know who Mark Jacobs is? Yeah, I figured that, okay. Company sells designer purses. Now, this is low, right? 400 bucks is cheap for a Mark Jacobs purse, I think. A uh, company that sells designer pur uh, uh, purses wants to evaluate whether or not the mean sales per purse exceeds 400. For random samples of 100 customers, the mean sale was $420. Took 100 customers, bought purses, and they found that the average that those customers paid for those purses was $420. They want to know, is that really different than the 400? Can I be 95% sure it's different than the 400? Or I just happen to get 100 that's, you know, like, uh, 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 that were a little bit on the high side. Okay, uh, is this sufficient uh, evidence to say the mean sales for all purposes, uh, all purses exceeded 400 with an alpha error of 0.05 and, or less? Okay, state your null hypothesis and so on and so forth. I'm going to get up a piece of paper here. Let's see, new paper. Where is it? New. Let's get that. Let's get a new piece of paper. There we go. Okay, so. What's the mean that we, that we think is the real mean? We want to know if the mean, the true mean, is equal to 400. Okay? What did our X bar, what did our sample say? Our sample of 100 people said that the mean was 420, right? And what was the standard deviation for that sample? 40. Okay, so if I took repeated samples of size 40, of size, uh, what was this, uh, sample size was 100. If I took repeated samples of size 100 from that, from that population, which has a mean of 400, right? What would my standard deviation be? Let's see. Well, standard deviation is 40. That's as close as I know to real population standard deviation. So the standard error for samples of size 100 is gonna be equal to 40 over the square root of 100, okay, that's going to be 40 over 10, it's going to be equal to 4, right? So now, our mean is going to, let's see, let's see what, the, what our z-score is going to be equal to now. Our z-score, the difference in terms of number of standard deviations difference between these two, is equal to, uh, is equal to uh, x bar minus the mean over the standard error. Remember that formula we looked at? That's going to be 420 minus 400 over the standard error, which is 4. How many z-scores are part of those things? 20 divided by 4. That's five standard deviations apart, right? So in order to get a z-score that big, right, if we looked at the distribution of all of these things, in order to get... Uh, if, if the standard deviation is, uh, if this is 400 and the standard deviation is, uh, what do we say it was, 4? That's, four, that's 404, 408, four, and so on. We'd have to be all the way out here, five standard deviations away. The probability of getting that big a value is way less than two standard deviations. So, we know that there's a difference because the chances of getting this big a difference between these two numbers would happen very rarely. Now, how do I structure this? 
the way I structure this is I start with a hypothesis. And my hypothesis starts off with x bar or mu for the group I'm testing or x bar is equal to the mu for the person, the mean for the purse. The mean for the population I'm testing is equal to the mean for the group that I'm investigating. Okay, so now those two, that's my null hypothesis, right? My null hypothesis is mu1 is equal to mu2. The two means are equal to one another. My alternative hypothesis is that mean 1 does not equal mean 2. And in order for me to reject my null hypothesis and accept my alternative hypothesis, I have to have less than 5% chance of being wrong. And the way I get that is to have a z-score which is bigger than one that would give me a 5% chance of being wrong. In other words, bigger than 1.96. In this case, it came out to be 5. Now, not only do I know there's less than 5% chance of being wrong, I also know that there's less than 0.00001% chance of being wrong. How do I know that? Because if I go into Excel and look up what a z-score of 5 represents, it represents a probability that's very, very small, maybe as small as this. Right? If this turned out to be, if this turned out to be 2 point three, right? My probability of being wrong, as long as it's over 1.96, it's less than 5% chance of being wrong. But if it's 2.3, I can actually go to a Z table and look up the actual probability, and it might be less than 2.5% chance of being wrong, or 2% chance of being wrong. That's my p-value, okay? So I can not only decide whether or not there's a difference between the two groups, but I can also predict how likely it is it's, uh, that I'm be, that uh, I can also uh, uh, predict how likely it really is that I would be wrong if I reject the null hypothesis and say the two groups, the mean for the two groups are different, right? So you got two, two ways you can use this. One way is to just say I reject the null hypothesis for, you know, uh, uh, and say that I'm at least 5%, there's less than 5% chance of being wrong, or actually describe using the p-value what the actual probability of being wrong is. Okay, so now you're going to go into the lecture and you're going to see this again. So you're going to get some benefit from repetition, right? The other guys will see it in the lecture, come over here, and they'll get that benefit from that repetition. But you're literally going to see exactly the same kind of thing. Okay, are you, are you fairly comfortable with this? It's not really that complicated. We're going to make it complicated in a couple of weeks. But right now, it's not really that complicated, right? <laughs> right? I think, you, I think if you go through the homeworks, that there's, a, there's, I think one homework has about six problems, the other one has about four. I encourage you to use Excel or SPSS to do them, you know, so you get that exercise. But if you get through those ten problems, you're going to have a pretty good idea of how these things are going to be worded and what they're going to look like, and you'll have a little bit of an exercise on how to do them. And like I said, we're not going to see each other physically for like three or four weeks now. However, spring break next week, spring break the following Monday, online, the third night, right? Between now and then, if you look at the announcement, there are links up for when, next Wednesday and the following Wednesday. I may have to make next Wednesday 10 to 11 instead of 9 to 10, depending on what my schedule is like. You're gonna but, take them about Yeah, what's that? You're gonna tape them. Oh yeah, I'll tape them. Yeah. And it's voluntary, completely voluntary. No attendance, you don't have to, you don't have to tune in for them. You can instead go to Daytona and have a good time, right? <laughs> Especially given, I,